and gentlemen, it's very nice indeed to see so many of you here um, and to welcome you. My name's Catherine Barnard, and you'll tell immediately that I am not Anan Menon, who um, is meant to be presiding over the event today. Um, he sends his um, uh, uh, apologies that he's not here. Very sadly, his father has just died and his father's funeral is taking place today. He's asked me to tell you that, which is why um, you've got me, the sort of second division Leeds United of the academic world, as opposed to the uh, Manchester United or Chelsea of the academic world. Um, but I have been asked to act as some sort of compare to, for today to try and keep things uh, moving and also to act as chair of this session. And I'm very delighted to welcome here today Bernard Jenkin, who I imagine everyone in this room um, certainly will know and will know of his many achievements. Uh, in brief, I'm not going to go through them all because I think you want to hear from him rather than from me. As you know, he's MP for Harwich and North Essex and was elected uh, to Parliament in 1992 and has been Chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee since 2010, which makes him um, ideal for this absolutely timely conference. Um, given the events of last week, uh, it's brought into very sharp focus the issues of the Constitution and the impact of Brexit on that Constitution. Now, as we all know, um, Bernard Jenkin is a long-standing Eurosceptic. He was one of the Maastricht rebels and so has um, got long service in that regard. But he's not a stereotypical Brexiteur because he has very liberal views on things like gay marriage and equalising the age of consent and so forth. He was a founding member of, uh, a founding director indeed, of Vote Leave and indeed featured in the Channel 4 documentary but sadly was not played by Benedict Cumberbatch. I don't know if you liked your own presentation in that uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, true. It, it, yeah, it's true. Drama. Um, the last time he kindly um, joined uh, UK in a changing Europe was on Brexit and local government. And then very shortly after that, he received a knighthood for political and public service. So presumably after today's performance, there's only one place to go after that. And presumably that, that is um, a peerage of some sort. Now, his influence is not just political. Um, he's had more impact on popular culture than many of you might realise. He's a friend, is that fair to say, of Richard Curtis? And so every time Richard Curtis writes a film, there's always a character called Bernard in it. And so on that um, note, I am going to say, give the floor to Bernard Jenkin to thank him very much indeed for talking to us. He's going to speak for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and then he's very kindly agreed to take some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, Bernard Jenkin. Well, thank you very much. And um, I, I'm sure we'd all want to convey our very best wishes and condolences to Arnand, who has um, led this initiative so ably and enthusiastically for a long period. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, say a few words, and I see um, uh, some familiar faces around the room, and some very distinguished ones uh, as well, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. So, Brexit and the Constitution, um, I find this title both uh, rather narrow and also very wide. Uh, first, Brexit as a constitutional event for the United Kingdom is significant because of what it intends to bring to an end. Those who claim that the EU is an emerging federal superstate are often told that this is not so because the EU is sui generis. By this, they mean it is made up of sovereign states, but it will not itself become a sovereign state based on the old Westphalian model of sovereign states because that is not how they see how the world will be in decades to come. Well, we shall see over time if the USA or Russia or China subjugate their national sovereignty to international institutions. I suspect not. But there is no denying that membership of the EU 
requires the subjugation of the national legal order to the EU one. In the UK, this has led to a clash between the legal doctrine of the sovereignty of the Queen in Parliament and the doctrine developed by the EU Court of Justice of the supremacy of EU law. Whatever the theory of the former, the UK has lived the constitutional reality of the latter. Assuming a clean break of some sort, that will come to an end. Secondly, we can talk about how the UK constitution must adapt as we leave the EU. This will unleash some new constitutional uncertainties. The passage of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 incorporates into UK domestic law all of the EU acquis, defined as EU retained law, so that there will be certainty about continuity of the UK statute book as we leave the EU. But the passage of that legislation through Parliament exposed many uncertainties, two in particular. One is what the role of our own courts will be. As a member of the EU, they were empowered to strike down UK statute law if they deemed it incompatible with EU law, even an act of Parliament. After we leave, Section 5.1 is clear that, and I quote, the principle of the supremacy of EU law does not apply to any enactment or rule passed or made on or after exit day, unquote. But how our courts choose to interpret that provision will depend upon how explicit Parliament is when it legislates in future. Section 6.2 says the court, and I quote, may have regard to anything done on or after exit day by the European Court, another EU entity, or the EU, so far as it, has, at, at it is relevant to any matter before the court. Other uncertainties arise from what has happened to the UK Constitution while we have been a member of the EU. Devolution was conceived while the EU largely controlled agriculture, fisheries, environmental policy and rules about state aids, for example. In the absence of the EU, these matters would be devolved by default. Clause 11 of the Bill, now Section 12 of the Act, became a vexed battleground for who shall decide what after we leave. As PACAC has pointed out in our reports, the original idea of devolution in the UK was binary. <clears throat> a power is either reserved or devolved. This leaves a constitutional and institutional void to be filled between Westminster and Whitehall on the one hand and the devolved parliaments and administrations on the other. The way it is filled will determine how control over some areas of policy is shared in much the same way as the EU and the Member States manage shared competencies. This is not just constitutional, legal or structural. It depends on developing a shared understanding about how things can best work and on the building of institutional and personal trust. Thirdly, there have been some significant constitutional events along the way to Brexit reflecting the political conflicts about Brexit. One such is the Miller case, which in the end did not change very much legally, but led to Parliament overwhelmingly to endorse the invocation of Article 50 and of taking the UK out of the EU. Another is the parliamentary innovations employed to attempt to thwart Brexit. Again, these events reflect political tensions as much arising from a hung Parliament rather than any substantial constitutional change. These things reflect the narrow, technical and legal questions on the subject of Brexit and the Constitution. But it is more important to look at its wider political aspects. Our Constitution remains largely uncodified, though there are more and more authoritative sources that compete with each other as we try to explain to ourselves what our Constitution means the Cabinet Manual, a new edition of Erskine May, more court judgments, and so on. In this, we like to think our Constitution is more exceptional than perhaps it is. However, written constitutions are no guarantee of liberty or political stability. 
a written constitution does not create any more certainty about where powers should lie. Just look at the US Constitution and how it has evolved. The separation of powers, partly frozen in time of the time of its writing, but also providing for the massive expansion of federal government in the, and in the political decisions taken not by the executive or the legislature, but by the Supreme Court. Each constitution is a living concept determined in the end by politics rather than law. So in considering Brexit and the Constitution, we should bear in mind the politics, why people voted leave, and what they were voting for or against. First, we must set aside the idea that the result was some kind of constitutional accident, or the result of lies, or people not knowing what they were voting about. The vote could not have been more explicit about remaining in or leaving the EU. If the bus had said 250 million instead of 350 million, it would not have appreciably changed the sentiment. And many would argue that there were far more powerful untruths told by the Remain side that, for example, there would be an immediate recession after a leave vote. And the notion in this referendum, aside from any other, that a significant part of the population do not deserve to have their vote respected, demonstrates exactly the kind of we-know-better elitism which alienates voters from the EU. We should look harder for the constitutional reason why the UK has rejected the EU and would do so again with more force, I believe, if we were to rerun the referendum. We all agree, I hope, that we want to preserve Western liberal democracy for our people to enjoy individual freedom, freedom of speech and assembly, to participate in democratic decision-making, and to enjoy a fair share of the economic goods of liberal economics. Vladimir Putin has claimed that liberalism is dead. Well, we must contest this. But when he points out, and I quote, the obvious problem is the gap between the interests of ruling elites and the overwhelming majority of the people, it is hard to contest that. People were voting to take back control, and voters seem to have a far clearer idea of national democracy and accountability than what they feel they have experienced in recent decades. The endless arguments about trade and economics which dominate the Brexit debate miss the point. Take VAT, for example. The EU has blocked the UK from removing VAT from sanitary products. More recently, it required the UK to apply VAT to energy-saving materials and to solar panels, contrary to the UK government policy. Where is the democratic accountability in that? So it was easy to apply the same sense of democratic outrage to questions like money and migration. Now add to that the sense that politics and business have enjoyed too cosy a relationship in the corridors of power in Brussels and in Westminster, where EU rules have too often been the excuse to protect the vested interests and the lifestyles of the decision makers and to ignore the wishes of voters and its game set and match to national democracy. It should come as no surprise that the people wanted to challenge the constitutional settlement established under the EU. The EU is made up of national democracies, but is itself very far from democratic. It is in fact surprising that it took so long, and that it is still taking so long, for the elites to realise that the future of liberal democracy must be founded on a more engaged, accountable and democratic constitutional settlement, probably based on the nation state and international cooperation, rather than on less accountable and less trans transparent supranationalism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed um, for that. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to kick off with? 
Okay, the gentleman at the front. Um, do you, do you, uh, just hold on one second, there's a microphone coming. Thank you very much. Um, is that all right? No. <laughs> Oh, it's on. It must be me. Um, on the idea of democracy, uh, one of the elements is informed consent. In other words, you know what you're doing, as it were. I wonder if I could have uh, some observation on the conduct of uh, national newspapers in the discussion debate uh, from the uh, speaker. Uh, I, I try not to read the Evening Standard too much, but or look at it. Uh, but uh, what role and what is the conduct of the national newspapers towards this uh, democratic uh, intake, uh, in your view? Uh, has it been sufficiently objective? I mean, what's your attitude to the conduct of the national newspapers in promoting informed consent? variety of our, um, our national newspapers, um, uh, which I think is um, uh, something we should celebrate, and uh, uh, I, I agree with some newspapers and not with other newspapers. I think some uh, provide much more uh, informative um, content than others, um, but um, I have, uh, generally I, ha I have no comment. I mean, if you were asking me about the BBC and the broadcasters, um, um, I, might, um, I might have a bit more to say um, in that um, I, think the, I think the BBC has struggled with the European question um, for a very long time. They did in fact commission a report back in 2005 um, and it was chaired by um, Lord Wilson of Dinton, a former cabinet secretary, on how the BBC tends to treat the European issue. Um, and, and that report, much to the BBC's annoyance, found that there was um, an institutional bias in uh, BBC reporting about European matters, that it tended to see, um, at that stage, the reporting of um, uh, European questions in politics through the lens of party politics, um, and uh, rather than on the merits of the question itself, um, and um, uh, the, the Today programme came in for particular criticism um, for um, um, the way it treated the, the question of the Euro. Um, and um, I personally remember quite early on during the passage of the Maastricht Treaty, meeting the editors of the Today programme with one or two colleagues and explaining to them why we thought the Euro would be a very bad idea for the UK. And uh, Rod Little is now on the record, having gone back to the, uh, um, the BBC and said, look, we've got to stop, start treating this argument much more seriously. And uh, he was treated himself as slightly bonkers um, um, because everybody believed that one day we would join the Euro. Um, and um, so I think, the, um, um, I think the BBC managed during the referendum campaign um, 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 a, a form of balance that was much fairer, but since the referendum campaign, I think they've seen their role as to challenge um, everything um, Brexit. Um, and that's fair enough. I think we can live with that, but um, uh, I don't think uh, we get a very even-handed approach. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, the, um, the question of the role of Article 24 of the GATT um, the GATT uh, Treaty. We, I don't know how much, time, how much time we've spent on this, how many uh, really eminent lawyers we have uh, engaged on uh, looking into this. And um, there is almost a sort of willful uh, determination to misconstrue what people are saying about GATT Article 24, that somehow we think it can be a unilateral act, and actually we have never said that. Um, that has uh, GATT Article 24 can only lead to an agreement by mutual consent with the other party. And um, there's a rather detailed point which um, even Andrew Neil got wrong with Boris on Friday evening, that um, uh, if you're using uh, paragraph 5B of Article 24, um, uh, you can sign a basic free trade agreement. Um, uh, and that is what we're proposing. 
uh, we're not proposing using Article 5C, which talks about an interim free trade agreement, which requires a declaration towards a comprehensive free trade agreement or a different trade agreements to future date. And um, even these things are, I mean, are complicated, and uh, th th there is a tendency for the BBC to um, ridicule Eurosceptic arguments and uh, research. Um, the same thing over the, the Northern Ireland um, border question. I mean, I think it's very difficult for the BBC, particularly as the government um, has also taken the part of the BBC on the Northern Ireland border, or rather the BBC has taken the part of the government of the BBC uh, on the Northern Ireland border. But there are practical and perfectly uh, reasonable arrangements that could be made to resolve the, the Northern Ireland border, even if we do not sign the withdrawal agreement, uh, which over time, if the EU um, were to choose to be reasonable about, would be perfectly, um, would, would avoid any infrastructure on the Northern Ireland border. I'm sorry, I've, I've given a long answer to that, but, um, yeah. Please, um, I, I found it, just, it is very, very frustrating trying to get the arguments over. Um, when, when the broadcast is a... Can I just a follow up? I hear what you say about Article 24 of GATT, and there must be quite a lot of people in the room who are sighing at even the mention of Article 24 of GATT, but the fact is, in order to have a free trade agreement with the EU, the EU won't agree to one until the three big ticket items have been sorted out, the uh, citizens' rights, the, the, the money, and the Northern Ireland border. So is your expectation that come the 31st of October there will be, um, the EU would agree to a, sh a quick and dirty free trade agreement leave and, and, and not worry about the content of the withdrawal agreement? Well, uh, this, this very much is the, the way that um, the, the present situation and the stance adopted by the EU reflects how the EU has um, offloaded all the responsibility for the consequences of the UK leaving onto the UK. Uh, it is, um, when um, a group of um, senior ex-ministers, uh, Ian Duncan Smith, uh, two, North, four, two former Northern Ireland secretaries, uh, David Trimble, um, uh, went to see um, uh, the European Commission, uh, it was the first time that the Commission was invited to accept that the Northern Ireland border should be a shared problem and not a problem just for the United Kingdom. And indeed, it, in fact, it is probably more of a problem for the EU because the UK government has no intention of erecting any infrastructure at the border. There is some ambiguity over the EU position who say they might, well, they, they never explicitly say so, which I think suggests that their, their negotiating <coughs> position is much weaker than they say. I don't think they will force the Republic to erect infrastructure or to implement checks on the border because they are not necessary. And um, the reason they're not necessary is if we were to agree um, what you call a quick and dirty trade deal, and we have actually drafted, uh, had drafted by leading council what a three or four page um, basic free trade agreement for goods would look like. Um, and it's not very difficult. I mean, when we say a free trade agreement between the UK and the EU should be the easiest free trade deal in history. It is because um, it starts from the basis of 100% alignment of all regulation of goods. And therefore, there is no incompatibility between anything that is being sold within the UK and anything that is already being sold within the EU. Uh, we have completely compatible product standards. So that's why it should be very easy. Um, of course, um, the negotiations themselves have made it so difficult. Um, but if there was, as what Boris is proposing, is that we offer the EU a very basic free trade agreement in goods at the outset, at the same time as we offer a complete standstill on any um, product regulation in UK law so that we remained 100% aligned with EU law and, and, uh, for a given period, um, there is no requirement for any checks at all on any goods passing between the EU and the UK. There is a technical need for customs declarations. Um, but in terms of checks and stopping and checking what is crossing the border, there would be absolutely no need at all because both sides could have 100% confidence that what was entering their own market was 100% compliant with their product standards. Um, and if we had zero tariffs and zero quantitative restrictions, you wouldn't need to uh, measure what was crossing or charge any tariffs, it would be a very simple process. We could effectively remain in 
uh, what would feel like a customs union until such time as we have more systems in place in order to, in the Northern Ireland's case, to run checks um, away from the border. Incidentally, there are already checks done in respect to the Northern Ireland border. Um, even though there is a free travel area, um, it is not unknown for buses or vehicles crossing the border to be checked, but not at the frontier. Um, there are already checks, SPS checks, on, on livestock movements. Um, but the checks are done in the farmyard or at the, um, at the market. They're not done at the border. In fact, there are, there are checks um, done on, um, uh, on, on transfers of livestock from the UK to the island of Ireland. There are checks done all over the place. And of course, it's a security frontier. It's a, it's a VAT frontier. Um, these things can be managed, and that's, that's what Boris's policy will be. And so in respect of your free trade agreement, um, it's obviously it's about goods, and that's, of course, a cute issue in Northern Ireland, but does that mean that services are going to be hung out to dry? Well, um, uh, um, it, it is not difficult to add in services. Um, uh, <coughs> on financial services, um, there is already tacit agreement to um, mutual equivalents. Again, on the basis of a standstill, this could be done quite, quite, um, quite simply. Um, I mean, in a way, that's what the withdrawal agreement set out to do, only the, the controls were draconian in that um, for legal purposes we would be deemed to be a subsidiary of the EU for the period of the withdrawal agreement. And um, the other unacceptable element to it, in my view, was um, the fact that um, we would have to commit to the 39 billion, though we don't actually know how much money that would turn out to be, um, regardless of whether we actually got a free trade agreement um, at the end of the process. Um, now, the reason why the EU might want to um, adjust its negotiating position is because the um, EU might have to face the consequences, A, of uh, actually applying tariffs and checks at borders, which would be very disruptive for its trade with the UK. Um, secondly, um, uh, this would not put the UK at such a disadvantage, seeing as we would collect some 13 billion of tariffs on goods being exported to the EU compared to the 5 billion the EU would collect on tariffs of UK trade sent to the EU. Um, uh, we would be able to protect the uh, sectors hardest hit by tariffs or protectionist measures. Even under WTO um, rules on subsidies? Uh, um, well, we can't directly compensate for the loss, for the cost of the tariff. You're completely right about that. Um, but, you know, we would not want all our upland farmers to go bust, um, and we would find ways of supporting them. We would not want, we could um, reduce other taxes or um, provide more investment incentives for the motor sector, for example. There are ways in which we could support uh, the sector's hardest hit, and one of the priorities should be preparing for a no deal, uh, should be to ensure that every sector is, is going to be protected in some way from the consequences of the worst case of uh, a no deal. But, um, I, and the other reason why the EU take might, want to, oh, might want to actually alter its position is because um, as the House of Lords Committee, um, Europe Committee, confirmed, the Article 50 is brutally clear about ending any UK obligation to pay any money to the EU um, uh, at the end of the Article 50 period. And um, personally, I would, I, I think that it'll be Boris's policy, if, that, if we get to that point, to offer to go to international arbitration. Uh, but that would be a slow process. Uh, it would be compliant with them all. Um, uh, and would create a budgetary crisis in the European Union immediately. Um, so I think there would be an advantage. I per if we do do a free trade agreement, a basic free trade agreement, I think we should willingly pay quite substantial sums to bail out the European Union for the effect of withdrawing our net contributions. Um, and I think on that basis there should be a deal. I, I, I'm, I'm not very confident that that will be the case, but in the end, that will be a choice for the European Union. We will be making a very reasonable pitch to the European Union for the continuation of free trade. I would also just add one other thing. Article 8 of the Treaty on the European Union does require the European Union to have good neighbourly relations with its non-member neighbours and uh, to pursue a relationship that's based on free and fair trade. 
Not so legally binding. Ending, sorry? Not legally binding. Well, it, it, it's in the treaty, um, and it, it, you know, if they take their treaty seriously, um, I don't suppose we would have any means of enforcement no, of exactly. that. I totally yeah. accept that. But um, they would not be living up to the spirit of their own aspirations and their own ideals um, if they were to abandon free trade with the United Kingdom. Can I stop you there? Because there's lots of people are asking questions. So what I might do is to take two. First of all, the gentleman um, with the glasses standing there, and then the lady um, in the row in front. And if you can keep your questions quite short. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, Keith Bess, uh, Secretary of the European Movement. Um, Bernard, I'm sure we both agree that democracy is not a single event, but a continuing process. And uh, there is concern about the fact that we had a referendum three years ago. Many of the people who voted in that are now dead. Uh, there's a new cohort of two million young people who weren't on the electoral register then, who now are. Um, I accept entirely that there is a, a lot of uh, credence given to the almost sacrosanctity of the referendum as being a democratic expression, and in fairness, a lot of remain... Are we expecting this? We are, OK. I'm, I'm okay. sure there's a message that happened during my question yeah. rather than during, <laughs> during, during, during your speech, Bernard. Um, but, but in fairness, I think a lot of Remain people are concerned about overturning the democratic will of the people, even though it was three years ago. What My question is this. What would actually enable people to change their mind from the decision that was taken three years ago? How f set in tablets of stone is that decision as to its longevity? Or would it be a general election? Would it be another referendum? Uh, albeit maybe on different, uh, a different question. I'm interested in what you feel is the continuing democratic process where if people have changed their mind, that thing can be given an expression. Okay, thank you. And then the lady in front. Alex Ronswick from Unlock Democracy. Um, you spoke a lot in your last answer about Northern Ireland and, and trade. Let's assume for the purpose of this question that uh, all of that has been negotiated, agreed, is in place and is working. The issues regarding Northern Ireland are not just about trade, they're also about human rights. One of the important aspects of the Good Friday Agreement is that regardless of which passport people born in Northern Ireland choose to have, that they have exactly the same rights, access to goods and services. Um, and there are obviously concerns, particularly in, in a no-deal scenario, that that won't continue to be the case in Northern Ireland. Um, what safeguards would you like to see the UK government putting in place, both at a constitutional and at a policy level, to protect rights in Northern Ireland? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I just deal with that first question first, and just ask you to enlarge on it for a second, because um, um, when you say the same rights, do you mean that the people in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland should have the same rights, or do you mean that the people in Northern Ireland should have the same rights as the people in the United Kingdom, the rest of the United Kingdom? I mean, born in Northern Ireland who, if one sits, two children, born in the same parents in Northern Ireland, one chooses to have an Irish passport, sorry, one chooses to have a UK passport, that they have the same rights and access to goods and services regardless of which passport they choose to have. Right, because I think that's always been the case no, um, um, uh, um, since uh, partition. Um, uh, uh, Irish citizens have had the right to travel here, to work, to claim benefits, to access the National Health Service, um, and to all intents and purposes, have, as far as I'm aware, have been, I mean, can you, can you think of a right that an Irish citizen living in the UK does not enjoy as a citizen of the UK? I'm not talking about people living in North Ireland. Well, I mean, I'm, but... One of the issues at the moment is about people born in Northern Ireland who, sorry, <laughs> people born in Northern Ireland who have an Irish passport, um, who choose to marry somebody who um, is not British and want to bring them to live in, with them in Northern Ireland. And they are being treated as British citizens rather than as European citizens under immigration law. So they are not being able to access their rights under their Irish citizenship um, because they are being treated by the UK Home Office as British citizens despite the fact that they've never taken out British citizenship. Well, I would like to understand more about that, but it sound, that sounds to me the kind of thing that can be resolved yeah. and should be resolved. It's not a reason to... Um, panic about the future of the, Northern, uh, the Good Friday Agreement. 
I, I think these things can be resolved. What I'm interested in is, is what we need to put in place to reassure people in Northern Ireland that they will continue to have those rights. I, 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 I agree with the implication of your question um, that there are a lot of people in Northern Ireland who need reassurance and that the debate about all this has been very disturbing and very unsettling. And um, I think it's something of a tragedy, really, that um, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and the status of Northern Ireland has become um, um, something of a pawn in the um, negotiations between the UK and the EU. Um, I, I, I don't, let's not look back and blame people for that, but I do think it's unnecessary and we can provide the reassurance necessary. The one thing I would say about the withdrawal agreement as it was offered to us with the backstop of it, in that respect, it was more of a threat to the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement, if not to the letter, and David Trimble was due to bring a court challenge against the government, claiming that the withdrawal agreement was uh, contrary to international law, because it would threaten to change the status of Northern Ireland without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland, um, which was one of the cardinal principles of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so I think we can... I'm, I'm, I'm hearing very carefully what you are saying, and I, I think it needs to be treated very seriously and very much more carefully in the negotiations than hitherto. Thank On the you. question mm -hmm. of um, how, how um, set in stone the result of the referendum is, this touches on a very uh, difficult and ill-considered question, which we did look, look at in our report after the referendum um, on um, how well the referendum had been conducted or not, um, because uh, we live in a representative democracy where the institutions and habits of representative democracy are very firmly ingrained. And we have never before had a referendum on a fundamental question uh, where the result of the referendum went against uh, the broad consensus of opinion of those who serve in politics. And um, it was also a referendum uh, which we described in our report as a bluff call referendum, i.e. it was uh, do this if you dare, you won't dare and we'll put this issue to bed, instead of um, perhaps more like the... Um, I mean, the, the Scottish referendum was also a bluff call referendum, but at least there was a Scottish government that did a great deal of work to explain um, and, ha and would end up with the responsibility to implement the effects of um, an independence vote. Um, however much work done by Business for Britain and Vote Leave, and there was a 500-page document called Change or Go, which did a great deal of analysis and work, um, uh, Vote Leave was never going to be the government that took over a responsibility for implementing the result. And this has created... Um, the problem that you describe, which I think is a very real problem, uh, the clash between representative and direct democracy. <coughs> I think in the end, um, this is a matter of politics, and in the end it will be resolved by representative politics. Either the House of Commons and Parliament will decide to put the question again, or a different question of some kind, to resolve this in a referendum, or um, uh, it will it will be washed through the system by a subsequent general election or several general elections. I don't see an easy solution to this. My own personal view is that if we were to embark on a second referendum, we would be plunging the country into yet further um, uncertainty and unhappiness and division, and uh, added to a real sense of betrayal amongst a significant part of the population, uh, which would feel that they had been promised a once-in-a-lifetime choice that would decide the question, and then that choice had been taken away from them. Uh, the EU um, has a habit of, um, of its member states um, having these second referendums. I don't think it has um, um, enhanced the legitimacy of the EU as an institution amongst the peoples of the European Union, and um, it, it, it has, I think, imbued a sense of complacency amongst people who run the European Union that they don't need to worry about uh, what people feel and 
the one thing the European Union was intended to perhaps avoid is um, the rise of extremist parties, and yet the European Union can be seen as one of the contributory factors towards the rise of extremist parties in even the most pro-European countries. Um, so, personally, I would caution against a second referendum. I think the representatives, the representative democracy has got to sort out the mess, and I personally think that we've got to implement the result that, as a parliament, as a representatives, we promised we would implement if there was a leave vote. Thank you. So, um, Vernon, gentleman at the front, and the, and again, if you can, and then I'll, I'll do further round. Um, if you can keep your questions short, please. Vernon Bolgenor, King, King's College, London. As I understand it, without an agreement, the Irish government is required to impose customs duties and regulations against uh, British goods. Now, with an agreement, you say it could be goods and also services, but the problem of the regulations, in some ways, is more serious, isn't it? If you Look at Turkey, which is in the customs union, but has tremendous problems with meeting EU regulations, and that requires some agreement on that. Now, the EU hasn't given any agreement uh, to any country that won't accept free movement, which I take it we won't. And there's a further issue, isn't there, whether the EU would allow us to undercut them by adopting different regulations and different tariffs to other non-EU countries. Either they would, which would be to their economic disadvantage, or if they didn't, we'd have to keep the same duties and regulations that we have now with the EU, which would make Brexit pointless, wouldn't it? So how would the free trade agreement, without uh, dealing with regulations, help? And if you had regulations in it, wouldn't it simply replicate our current position with the EU? Thank you. Gentleman at the front here. Can I just deal with that because there's a great deal in that question. Yeah. Um, first of all, if there was a basic free trade agreement on goods at the outset, that would presume, um, that, that would be an interim arrangement, a temporary arrangement, um, although it would be uh, posited as permanent until such time as we have a comprehensive free trade agreement, more along the lines of the Canada um, CETA agreement. Um, during that period of the basic free trade agreement, you are right that it would be necessary for us to maintain harmony in our regulation with the European Union. And um, for there to be zero tariffs, we'd have to carry on charging the, common ex the EU common external tariff to the rest. That's done. So that solves that problem. And in terms of the comparison with Turkey, Turkey does have problems complying with product regulation in the EU. Um, that is not a problem we have. Um, we are meticulous in our compliance with EU regulations. So the EU can have confidence. And you say that the, we would be required to apply checks. Uh, the WTO only requires, uh, well, only permits checks um, um, to be reasonable where there is a lack of confidence um, that there is compliance. Where there is confidence of compliance, it's not necessary to check. So consequently, uh, the, the, the port of Felixstowe, which is just the other side of the River Stour in my constituency, um, is our largest container port and imports uh, very large volumes of goods from outside the European Union. The vast majority, 96, 97% of the containers are not checked at the port. Um, it is understood what's in them, that they comply, uh, that the, uh, the people who are shipping the containers are rep reputable, uh, they might check them, uh, even on the Norway, it's interesting, even on the Norway-Sweden border, where they do conduct some checks, they do actually present documentation at the border, but that's not necessary, that's just a historical anomaly. Um, what they do check for is people smuggling, arms smuggling, uh, terrorism, intelligence about drugs and that sort of thing. They don't actually check um, for compliance of goods, because there is, high, there is high confidence that there is compliance um, at the border. So, um, I don't really accept all the premises of your question, um, but I, and I think these problems can be resolved. But I emphasise, they have to be resolved by two willing parties. If the EU... Uh, are you saying that we would have to um, agree to free movement? Well, that's, that's, that's an issue for the EU. Um, if the EU wants us to um, apply free movement uh, during this period, Maybe that's something we could um, bilaterally agree to. I don't know. I'm, I, but um, 
uh, for a temporary period during the standstill period. But again, that's what the withdrawal agreement broadly re reflects. Um, and uh, if, the, if it wasn't for the draconian legal subjugation um, and the, um, the cost without benefit of the withdrawal agreement and the backstop, um, the, the withdrawal agreement would be, if the withdrawal agreement was a genuinely bilateral, equal agreement, um, I think uh, we, 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 we wouldn't be having this conversation now. Okay, thank because you. It's, uh, it, because it's, um, it, it presents the EU as so much a superior power as the agreement, and afterwards, is why the, the agreement wouldn't go through the House of Commons. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, uh, briefly, please. Uh, thank you. It's Masato Kimura, Japanese freelance journalist. Uh, these days, many politicians all over, all over the world want to talk about culture, a tradition, a sovereign, and 20th century style nation state. And uh, so, oh, in the case of Japan, South Korea, unfortunately, the uh, trade war occurred because they are talking about uh, tradition and uh, sovereign, e each other. And uh, so, I want to believe you are super libertarian. Uh, what kind of sovereign uh, do you expect in the 21st century? Thank you. And the gentleman there in the blue, blue shirt, yeah. And then also we'll just take the, the gentleman in the white shirt. As a result of all the Brexit and all what happened, do you feel there are elements of UK constitution that are weak and that need to be addressed going forward? And what are they? Um, oh, sorry, there's one, we're just going to do that. Do you want to? Okay. Um, you provided a, a short analysis of what you thought were the kind of some of the driving factors of the, the Brexit votes, uh, one of which was <clears throat> the perceived closeness between our democratic institutions and business. So I'd be very interested to hear how you think that might change after EU exit. Sorry, can you say that again? Um, how, how, what will change? Business and <clears throat> politics. So business, the, oh, business and politics. Yeah, the perceived closeness between our, our democratic institutions and business and how that might change after EU exit. Um, thank you very much. What kind of sovereignty do I think the UK would enjoy outside the European Union? It would be very much the same kind of legal uh, and uh, national sovereignty enjoyed by the vast majority of um, nation states who are not in the European Union. Most countries aren't in the European Union and they're absolutely fine and they enjoy far more autonomy over their laws. Uh, and democratic decision making than members of the European Union. And um, so countries like Canada, Australia, um, uh, uh, Switzerland, um, these are all countries where their sovereignty is not, national sovereignty is not questioned. And in fact, Japan is another very good example of um, a, a nation that trades a very high proportion of its GDP, um, and um, but is not subject to any external jurisdiction. Um, quite a lot of my American friends, uh, particularly in the Democratic Party, are um, often can't understand why the United Kingdom wouldn't want to be in um, a much larger arrangement like the European Union. But when you explain to them that, um, you know, would you subjugate the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States to a, a, an even more Supreme Court in Rio de Janeiro or Ecuador, um, they, they get the point <laughs> that um, they, they want ownership of their own democratic decision making. And the point I'm making about sovereignty is that, um, um, is that the disconnection of um, decision making as it affects people's lives from the recognised and legitimate democratic national institutions has actually created a kind of dislocation. And I'll come straight to that point about business. Because the, um, the EU has the EU is is very much a regulated market, very much a highly regulated market, where regulation is negotiated between what they call the two sides of industry, and they have uh, the, the comitology of the EU um, is very subject to the lobbying by powerful vested interests, so that the regulation um, turns out to have. Uh, protectionist effects. One of the reasons why the EU finds it hard to do free trade agreements with other countries 
is because, not because of the tariffs, but because of the, the, the non-tariff barriers that have been embedded into our system. And those non-tariff barriers are not very good at promoting innovation, uh, not very good, uh, are very good at protecting industries from new entrants. Um, and um, so business, particularly big business, rather likes that. And um, the cosy relationship between the politicians and, and business is one of the things that's got to change. The, um, I think um, but the public have lost faith in the legitimacy of big business. Um, the, um, the banking collapse and um, the riches harvested by directors of privatised utility companies, the collapse of companies like Carillion, um, uh, where people, where, the, where the, a kind of rentier class of directors seem to leave with very large wealth, um, even though their employees are being made redundant, um, and the, the fact that very large contracts are passing between the public sector and the private sector. Um, there is a sense that this system isn't very accountable and transparent, and um, I think one of the things that big business is going to have to do with the assistance of government is to improve its governance and transparency. And particularly big businesses that serve customers very much put their customers before their profits and their stakeholders before their profits. Big businesses have to make profits, um, but they should be the byproduct of a successful enterprise, uh, not the sole objective. And I think the whole emphasis of the values and um, uh, principles by which people govern large businesses, directors run large businesses, needs to be looked at. They need, we need to encourage business to look, to behave very much more visibly in the public interest rather than in just the interests of their shareholders, um, who are only one interest that they have to have regard to for a successful business. And the gentleman's question there. Yeah. So the, um, the, that was a question about what, uh, what aspects of the British Constitution will need to be addressed as we leave. Well, I mentioned the whole devolution question, um, and I think that is by far the most urgent, urgent thing, um, because there is um, there is very little institutional um, underpinning to the relations between Westminster and Whitehall and the devolved parliaments and governments. Um, and we actually visited and looked at other countries uh, which have decentralised systems and they have very much more mature and um, uh, less adversarial. I mean, go to Canada, I mean, they, it's what they argue about all the time, but it's a kind of settled institutional framework where everybody knows what the rules are and there's a, a basic trust and understanding. Many things are deadlocked in Canada uh, between the, uh, the, um, the, the provinces and the, um, and the territories and the um, federal government. Um, but it's a country that has a very strong sense of its identity and the, um, uh, the Quebec separatists are, are for the moment, quiescent. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn from how we cultivate a trust and understanding and I think it's by far the most urgent question constitutionally uh, for us to deal with. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? So, Meg. Okay. And the lady there, I think we'll, those are the last two we're running out of time. Okay, Meg. Um, yeah, Meg Russell from the Constitution Unit. You touched in your remarks a few minutes ago on the tensions which are the topic of the panel I'm speaking on later on between representative and direct democracy. And you said um, that in the end our representative institutions will sort this out. You are, of course, traditionally a great defender of Parliament. Does this mean that you would advise the next Prime Minister to rule out the idea of proroguing Parliament in order to avoid a vote on a no-deal Brexit? Okay, and the lady there. Hi, good morning. Um, my question is very simple. Do you think it's realistic to think that we will be able to sustain our economy coming out of the um, European Union? and maintain the strong economy and strong political uh, renome that we had experienced over the years, knowing fully well the tendency is um, globalization, empire, blocks. How do you think, realistically speaking, we will be able to sustain that position? Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, 
The Perot question is um, um, one, I mean, the idea that you prorogue Parliament to frustrate what Parliament wants to do um, uh, would, to me, be pretty unconscionable. And um, uh, the, the conundrum we have at the moment is that Parliament has voted to invoke Article 50, which guarantees, does not guarantee a deal, uh, and passed the EU Withdrawal Act to facilitate the EU uh, the, the transition to uh, leave the EU. Um, uh, to some extent, uh, democracy has been served. And um, um, in fact, for a very large extent, democracy has been served. Um, uh, many people who see... Uh, uh, there is a difficulty with ruling out leaving without a deal. Because as soon as you do that, um, uh, you put all the negotiating leverage into the hands of the European Union, which is why we are where we are. And it's quite clear that we've finished up with the withdrawal agreement as it was because that was always the policy of the government, even though they never said that. Um, in September last year, I was telling colleagues that there was no way that, he, that Theresa May was going to take us out without an agreement. There might have been an accident, but it was never going to be her intention. Um, um, there's a, a certain amount of cant about prorogation. I mean, John Major prorogued Parliament uh, quite a long way before a general election in order to avoid something inconvenient appearing in Parliament. Um, uh, the Labour Party prorogued Parliament in order to accelerate the, um, um, the Parliament Act process in order that it could get its legislation through. Um, uh, um, I don't anticipate that Boris will prorogue Parliament, but um, it's for him to explain why he hasn't taken it off the table. Um, Thank you, the lady there. And as for, as for our economy, I would be encouraged um, by the fact that the vast majority of countries, including many countries quite like the United Kingdom, are not in customs unions or, um, or in the European Union, and they are equally prosperous. Um, and in fact, some countries are more prosperous. In fact, the, the fundamental um, thing for the, European, for the UK in the EU is that, as I mentioned, um, by being in the EU, we avoid about five billion a year in tariff charges on our exports. Um, but we're paying a net contribution of 10 or 11 billion uh, for the privilege of membership. Um, that doesn't seem to be a very good equation from our point of view. Um, if, we, uh, if we leave even without a withdrawal agreement and suffer some dislocation and uh, um, uh, require to make speedier adjustments, I would anticipate the government to loosen fiscally, to um, uh, use measures to accelerate investment, to um, adjust our common external, t our UK external tariff in order to maximise uh, to bring down prices in some goods and to maximise uh, the uh, competition in the UK markets while protecting other, other sectors. Um, uh, and um, the balance of payments would immediately improve. Um, and uh, there are economists who argue that um, we would in fact probably grow the economy faster for the first year or two outside the European Union um, than, than if we uh, carry on with this a protracted uncertainty. Um, and um, there, there is probably a great deal of investment being held off because of this uncertainty. And in the long run, I agree with what Mervyn King said. He said that um, uh, students of economics will be hard pressed to see any um, significant, um, 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 significant variation in the curve of um, growth of GDP in the UK to find where the U UK actually left the EU. It will not be a significant change. The economy will have to go through a period of adjustment. The kind of economic growth that we enjoy will be different. But it always seems to me that um, since 2005, it's been remarkable, despite the advantages, the supposed advantages, of being in the customs union, 
um, we are growing our exports much faster to those countries in goods, um, to those countries outside the European Union than inside the European Union. And moreover, we have a trade surplus with the rest of the world, but we have somehow locked ourselves into a very large trade deficit with the European Union. So I think the advantages of the present relationship in the long term are very much overstated, and the disadvantages of being outside um, are also overstated. I think there will be significant advantages in the long term. But in the end, Can I, I, just this one point, I don't think it's going to be massively significant. I think the whole emphasis on trade um, has been, um, to some extent, a distraction. This was a political decision. It's a decision about democracy and accountability, um, and that is why uh, we must carry out the decision, because I don't see that, even if we had another referendum, the result would be different. Thank you very much. Okay, indeed. thank you very much indeed for that. <clears throat>